Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Ron Garrett. I'm here with my friends Nicole Stott and Anusha Ansari. And we want to share some stories with you today. Uh, but before we do, we want to set the stage by talking about one specific image. Now, images have the power to change our perspective. They can change the way we see our world. They can change the way we see ourselves. And there's probably no image that has changed the way we see ourselves more than an image that was taken on Christmas Eve, 1968. Now, the story begins 50 years ago, atop the tallest, the heaviest, the most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status, the Saturn V sat the crew of Apollo 8. The mission objective was to be the first crewed spacecraft in history to travel to the moon, enter into orbit around the moon, and of course to return back safely. Now this would propel the United States in the race to be the first on the moon, to propel them ahead of the, of the Soviet Union. But after reaching the moon and entering into orbit around the moon, the crew witnessed something never seen before by human eyes. As the crew experienced the Earth rising from behind the lunar horizon, I wonder if they realized the significance of that moment. They had just become the first humans in history to see the, ho the whole Earth as a planet and the first to capture that for the rest of us. This famous photograph, commonly known as Earthrise, is probably the most influential photograph ever taken. This image showed us for the first time our living planet, our biosphere, our Earth. It revolutionized how we see the world, how we see ourselves, with its simple message that we are one people traveling on one planet towards one shared future. In this breathtaking beauty is a deep heralding to the unity, to the unity that we as a species are called to. Since then, less than 600 people have traveled to space. The three of us standing before you have had that privilege. We were able to escape the confines of our planet and look back and profoundly experience seeing our beautiful planet from the vantage point of space. I was born a long, long time ago in a country far, far away, <laughs> in Mashhad, Iran. Um, I loved the night skies. I would sleep outside summer nights and look at those stars, and I wanted to fly up there and touch them. I wanted to understand what they're made out of. I wanted to understand what our world made out of us and how it's built. This love of space allowed me to um, you know, exercise my imagination. When I was 12 years old, before I knew it, there was a revolution in Iran. Um, there were shouting, screaming, burning buildings, gunshots. I was scared. I had never heard a gunshot before. Before I could even adjust to that, there was a war. There was an eight-year war that broke out with, between Iran and Iraq. And uh, th within the first year, there were bombings. There were long lines for food and sh uh, fuel. Um, there were uh, gunshots and sirens. We had to go to shelter. It was a scary time for me. But there was one place I could always go at night and look at the beautiful night skies and let my imagination take me to a different place, to a different planet perhaps, some place that was peaceful, some place there were no gunshots, some place that I could take the rest of my family and everyone who wanted to go with me and be safe and be playful. And that's what I wanted to do. On September 18, 2006, I had the amazing opportunity to fly to International Space Station for an 11-day mission. It was my dream come true. I was now actually floating in space where I wanted to go amongst those stars that I dreamed of. I was looking at our planet, and I was able to see this beautiful canvas of tans and crimsons of the desert with the deep greens of the forests and highlighted by the whites of the highest mountain peaks. I could see the glow of the serpentine rivers as they flow, flowed into the sea. And it was an amazing, colorful uh, canvas that I was looking at. 
But what amazed me the most was these deep blue colors, the different shades of blue of our ocean, which covers most of our planet, our blue planet. And I was mesmerized by it. I looked down on Earth and what I could see and feel was this um, energy, life energy coming from it. I could see no borders, no walls, nothing was dividing us, we were all one. And the feeling that I got, the sense of oneness that I had with the planet and with everyone else on it, was something that I wanted to share with everyone. I wanted to be able to tell everyone how we're connected and we're all citizens of one planet Earth, that we're all astronauts on this spaceship Earth going through the universe together. And I imagine how that would transform everyone's lives. So my dream of becoming an astronaut was realized when I, along with the crew of STS-124, launched into space aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. But I remember that first day, that first day in space, the most remarkable, the most memorable, the most amazing thing was when I had the opportunity to look out of the window for the first time. When my tasks were over, I got to unstrap and float over to a, to a window. Uh, it was just absolutely breathtaking. And I remember the, the first thing that hit me was just how incredibly thin our atmosphere appeared. And in that moment, that sobering moment, I was hit with the realization that that paper-thin layer is what's keeping every living thing on this planet alive. But in spite of this fragility, I couldn't help but fall in love with the beauty of our planet. It's a, it's a constant dance of, of color and light and motion. And what was really amazing and beautiful was to see the colors change on the Earth, to see thunderstorms casting long shadows across the horizon and watch the clouds turn from pink to red to gray and finally to black. And then as we crossed into the, the dark side of the orbit, to see all the lights of the cities and towns, all the evidence of human activity all of a sudden come to life. And it really gave me the sense that we live on a living, breathing organism. Now we saw amazing things, many amazing things in space. The paparazzi-like flashes of lightning storms, dancing curtains of auroras that seemed so close, it was almost as if we could reach out and touch them. Now this was an incredibly overwhelming visual experience, but it was it was also much, much more than just a visual experience. What I experienced in space was a profound sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to see the planet from that perspective and gratitude for the planet that we've been given. And in some way, I don't think I'll ever be able to fully put into words, being physically detached from the Earth made me feel deeply interconnected with everyone on it. Now, Although I didn't have the, the view of the Earth that the Apollo 8 guys had, nevertheless from space, I was able to look back and see what we have always been. One single human family with a common origin, and now in a very real way, I had a deep awareness of the reality of our common future. And as you can tell, we all... <laughs> we all what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just me. We all share similar feelings about uh, our experience in space. Even with some of the different twists on the stories about it, the underlying reaction is the same. Flying in space brings us back to Earth. We see a living, breathing planet. It is our home. It brings us back to home. And while there are a lot of complex things that go on while we're in space, I came home with three very simple lessons to share. And that's that we live on a planet, we are all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. Now these stunning views, they remind us of what it was like to be in space. It is, like Ron said, overwhelmingly, impressively beautiful. And while it looks like we're slowly passing over the planet, I know that we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, or five miles a second, which means that we get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets every 45 minutes as we go around the Earth every 90 minutes. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And these views also remind me, like Ron said, how separated I was, but how in contrast to that physical distance, I don't think I ever felt any more connected to everyone and everything below me than I did right then. 
Every time I looked out the window, there was some new surprise. The vastness of the oceans. There was a depth and color and texture to them that I had never experienced or felt before. And when I looked out the window, I wanted to see familiar things. I wanted to see Florida from space. I considered Florida my home. But very quickly, Florida became just this special place on Earth that's my home. I don't know when exactly that happened, but believe me, it does. I started thinking about Earth not just as home, but as a planet, as a planet in space, and as a living organism. I couldn't deny the interconnectivity of everything that I saw below me. And I started thinking about us all as Earthlings. So during my six months in space, I, I got into a routine where I would, I would almost say goodnight to the Earth. When my tasks were over, it was time to get ready for bed. I would go to the cupola, which is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station, and I would just gaze at the Earth for a little while. And as I would gaze back at this, at this beautiful scene, I, I would wonder what the next 50 years would look like. How far would we progress in overcoming the challenges facing our planet? And as I would take in this beautiful scene, I would routinely be hit in the gut with a sobering contradiction between the beauty of our planet and the suffering that exists on our planet. What I couldn't reconcile was the indescribable beauty of our seemingly peaceful blue planet suspended in this inky blackness. And yet, on that same planet, there are untold tragedies that happen every day. So as many of our colleagues report from the ISS, you can actually see the negative effect humans have made on our planet. Clear cutting of forests, mountaintop removal operations, industrial pollutants entering rivers, giant crop burnings that, that cover whole areas of, of, the, of the globe that send smoke to the limits of the atmosphere up to, you know, to cover almost entire continents. I launched into space with the belief that we already right now have all the technology, all the resources necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. And so I spent a good deal of my time earth gazing, pondering the question, if this is true, why do they still remain? And more importantly, what can we do to address these challenges? The seeds to the answer to that question <clears throat> lies in our shared experience of living and working on the International Space Station and the valuable lessons that experience gives us for life here on Earth. So for my time in space, this was my home, this beautiful masterpiece in space, the International Space Station or the ISS. There is no better example of living off the grid than the ISS. <laughs> there are systems that regulate all the conditions that we need to survive the right amount of oxygen for us to breathe, clean water for us to drink. But these systems are not automatic. They require care and maintenance and attention. And we go about our daily activities, our science experiments in space, and these life support systems are what keep us alive in an otherwise lifeless expanse of space. Through the ISS, we have created mechanical systems in space that do the best we can to mimic what our planet does for us naturally. So as you heard, uh, on Space Station, we rely on machines. These machines are uh, you know, our life support system, and we take good care of them. And uh, you can bet if something goes wrong with any of those machines, everyone will come together, collaborate, and make sure that we fix it immediately, because we can't live without them. So we're hoping that we can apply the same sense of urgency here on our planet. We're all crew of the spaceship Earth, and we need to take care of our life support system to have a beautiful, peaceful spaceship that we can all live on. Here at home, we need to come together, collaborate, and uh, be able to fix and restore our life support system. In the words of uh, legendary Buckminster Fuller, we should learn how to become crew of the spaceship Earth, not just passengers. And on the ISS, we are acutely aware of the conditions that are necessary to sustain life. And with our help, the machines do this for us. When we return from our time in space, though, even though we intellectually knew it before, we become acutely aware that we require these same conditions down here on Earth to survive.
But down here on Earth, it's not the machines that do this for us. They aren't creating those conditions. It's life itself. It's the living, breathing planet. It's the humans and plants and animals. It's the chemical mixtures of air and the oceans. It's the Earth itself, all interconnected, that creates these conditions. It's biodiversity. And as you've heard tonight, the two most important things uh, about the International Space Station are that we have these amazing, strong international relationships that it's built on. But perhaps more importantly, is that we're living there like we should be living here on Spaceship Earth. We must all work together to protect our biosphere, the life support systems of our planet, for ourselves and for the benefits of the countless possible next generations and for all life. Because of this, we decided to get all of our astronaut friends together. Uh, and we've launched a couple years ago an organization called Constellation. And our first mission is inspired by the work of E.O. Wilson's Half Earth uh, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. So we are working to advocate for and to point attention to this important work and so that together we can inspire the actions necessary for nations to sign and embrace the pivotal Convention on Biological Diversity in uh, 2020. We want to bring together astronauts, and we are bringing together astronauts from all around the world to share their profound experiences of seeing the beauty of the, our planet from space, from their different national, cultural, uh, religious backgrounds, and partner with National Geographic Society and work with all the various organizations signed up for Campaign for Nature. And we want to work with all of you, in addition to that, advocating for this most important set of goals in our civilization's history. So our shared vision, constellations, Nat Geos, hopefully all of you here in this room and anyone that you touch outside of these rooms, is to come together and make sure that we can preserve 30% of Earth's biodiversity by 2030 and increase that to 50% by 2050. We also need to make sure that we meet all the 17 sustainable development goals and we do everything possible to make sure that we don't have global warming um, exceed the limits of one and a half degree Celsius. This is just called good housekeeping. It's called planet, planetary stewardship. And we have to all work together and aspire to live up to these goals. And no matter where we're from, what we do, what nation we're from, we have to do it together. And we have to come together to make our planet safe again. Our time in space has proven that when we start from a foundation of awe and wonder, we open the mind to new ideas and solutions that encourage cooperation together. And it's only through profound cooperation and a shared mission that we'll build a future that we all want to, to experience here on Earth. Awe and wonder are the secret ingredient that changes everything. They can allow us to create a better future. There should be no passengers on Spaceship Earth, only crewmates. And as crewmates, we are all responsible for the minding of the ship and the care of each other. I hope you can tell that we as Constellation, uh, as our crew, are excited to be uh, joining National Geographic uh, as a voice for uh, the Campaign for Nature. And together, we know that we can create a positive future where all life thrives. Thank you. <laughs>